That's great. We're saving time at the start of the day because we're expecting all our speakers to stick to eight minutes. Um, so we'll say that. The next session that we're moving on to now, so that was our human factors session, is chaired by Dr. Emily O'Connor, a consultant in Connolly and Blanchestown, and Dr. Fergal Hickey, that bloke off the TV, and a consultant in Sligo Hospital as well. It's about the projects that have been supported by the Emergency Medicine Programme to help us with the delivery of patient care. Thanks, Jerry, and welcome to everyone. We're very excited to be um, showing you some of the work we've been done, we've been doing with the Emergency Medicine Programme. Uh, so Ferdinand and I are going to chair this session. Um, so I'm going to introduce the first speaker, um, and that is Liz Roach. And we are launching today the ED Workforce Planning Document. Um, and it's looking at supporting and standardising nursing work, uh, nursing, the nursing workforce in emergency departments nationally. So welcome to Liz. Thank you very much, Dr. O'Connor and Dr. Hickey, and to all the Emergency Medicine Programme team for inviting me to um, speak to your conference today about the development of the framework for um, workforce planning for nursing and to officially launch it. This is just be a, a brief outline of the presentation this morning where we'll look at just a general introduction as to the drivers for the development of the framework, the main aim and aims and objectives of the project, looking particularly at uh, some of the methodology uh, and the scope in terms of what we did and didn't look at. Uh, then a whistle-stop tour of the actual framework document itself uh, and an equally whistle-stop tour of the governance of the project. So the development of the framework document or the request to develop the framework document came originally from the emergency medicine program itself. At that time it was chaired by Dr. Una Geary. Uh, from St. James's, and she asked my colleague uh, Susanna Byrne, who was the service planner on the emergency programme, to uh, consult with the National Nursing Office around the possibility of looking at developing a framework that would support nursing and nursing rostering and really looking at the most effective utilisation of the nursing resource within emergency departments. Given that it's of significant importance to look at and ensure that there is appropriate staffing throughout the 24-hour period. Um, there is significant evidence these days in relation to the importance of having appropriate staffing, not just nursing staffing, but all uh, clinical staff within emergency departments and all clinical areas for that matter. Uh, and there's evidence of the link between that and patient safety. Specifically in the context of nursing workforce planning for emergency departments, there was um, a perception that there was a lack of evidence around the determination of nurse staffing within the emergency departments. There weren't specific tools uh, that could be used and applied within the Irish context uh, or particularly approved for use within the Irish context. Also, there was a perception that different emergency departments looked at their staffing in different ways and, and we're, we're all familiar with some of the history around that. Similarly, there were uh, policy uh, agendas to support the requirement for doing this, not least the HICWA standards, specifically identifying the requirement uh, to ensure that we have the right workforce. So the aims and objectives of the project were, as identified here, to develop a framework to support and standardise workforce pl uh, planning for emergency de departments nationally. It was led by my colleague, as I said, Susanna Byrne, who's the director of the Nursing Midwifery Planning and Development Unit for Dublin South, Kildare and Wicklow. So the idea of doing it, as I say, is identified up there, but also it was about facilitating a ground up approach to the determination of staffing. Historically and often, uh, staffing might be determined either by the budget that's available or staff that's available or combinations of the same or whatever we used to have would a wee bit more if, if we are able to link it to um, department activity or that sort of thing. And we're all very familiar with the impact of the downturn um, in the economy generally in Ireland and the impact that that had on staffing, all types of staffing throughout uh, our hospital system. So what we did uh, was um, we went out to tender to bring in some external expertise to support us 
to come up with a particular framework that would support nursing workforce planning. Uh, and that involved uh, tendering to a number of uh, external organisations, and the tender was won by the RCSI Institute of Leadership. Uh, the project officers themselves from the RCSI were Shabelle Carolyn and uh, Dr. Philip and Ryan Witherow, who is now the, one of the deputy chief nursing officers in the Department of Health. So we sought, we were very clear from the outset uh, to identify what exactly we wanted from it. We were very clear that the outputs of this framework was to be a report, a really good thorough report of the literature pertaining to staffing. Um, we also wanted a toolkit that uh, identified a number of templates that staff could use in a practical way that would support them develop the staffing that they needed within the departments. Uh, and we also identified at the outset that we wanted a training programme. So just a practical training programme for staff who work in emergency departments to support the application of the toolkit in clinical practice. Uh, so in doing that, we identified five different stages for the project um, and supported the RCSI team to actually deliver all of those components. The national and international literature, uh, the development and testing of the tools themselves, uh, the design and the integration of additional supportive data evidenced by its application in practice and the testing of it in practice, evaluating it and finally designing it, and then in the latter end, uh, developing um, the education program to go with it. So the literature review, we asked them to look at the general literature pertaining to nursing and midwifery workforce planning, general literature relating to issues pertaining to emergency department, who presents issues pertaining to patient presentation, et cetera, et cetera. We asked them to look at any evidence and to review, to critically review uh, tools that might be in place internationally to determine staffing requirements, nursing and midwifery staffing requirements, and also to look at the general overall professional nursing issues that emanate either from policy or our professional regulator, all of which have an impact on the number of staff. And so they did all that. Uh, then we developed a toolkit, which I'll go through in a couple of minutes, uh, and then the education programme. So the toolkit itself uh, has six different components. Uh, you can actually see them for once fairly well there. Uh, they look at the demand for care, so that looks at um, ensuring that the senior nursing team within emergency departments have an understanding of the aspects of patients' presentation that have an impact on staffing. So it's looking at the numbers of people who attend, the prof their profile, um, their patterns of presentation, et cetera, et cetera. And within that uh, particular um, aspect of the toolkit, there are two templates that are within the, uh, the toolkit to support emergency departments look at those aspects of care. The next area was looking at the operational characteristics. And within that, again, there's two areas that need to be examined. The physical layout of an emergency department, as we all know, like if you've got nooks and crannies, it all has an impact on patient observation, um, monitoring patients, et cetera, et cetera. So that will understandably have an impact on the staffing that's required. Uh, similarly, it's important to look within this component, looking at the operational models within uh, the emergency department. So that might be looking at what are the pathways of care that's identified uh, for various presentations. So are there streaming approaches used? Do you have designated minor injuries? Um, do you have a specific mental health liaison service? Uh, do you have a RAT service? Uh, perhaps a um, medical assessment unit? Uh, and, and whether or not there are those types of services, because once again, that all determines not just the numbers of staff that are required, but the educational preparation and the development of staff to support uh, whatever models of care um, are in place. So again, there's two templates that were identified to support that. Within the workforce capacity component of the framework, uh, or the toolkit specifically, um, that's about looking at the capability of the current team uh, to meet patient need. So that's kind of looking at what's your establishment, how many staff do you have of the different grades, uh, what kind of hours do they work, what's their turnover, what's the timeout that they use, what kind of rosters are in place, how are the roles utilised? And we've identified within the framework a methodology um, 
kind of an observational, methodol uh, uh, observational analysis methodology that assists departments look at, well, what exactly are people doing and can we kind of explore how that might be done maybe more efficiently uh, to increase or maximise the utilisation of the various nursing force and to look at role expansion and role expansion of ner registered nurses, role expansion of healthcare assistants, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and also within that section, uh, there's support for the from the role utilisation kind of um, directions uh, and templates to support emergency departments look at how role could be developed in that context. So within the workforce capability, I mean, it makes sense. It's from an English, basic English language perspective. If you know what your numbers are and who's there, then you need to kind of look at, well, what are the qualities and the abilities of that team? What's their professional qualifications? Um, what cuts their, their mandatory training? So within your emergency department, have you identified a set amount or type of mandatory training that you want everyone to have? How up to date are they with that? Uh, specifically emergency department work that you would have identified that's important. So it's about really getting a true picture of the detail of your existing workforce. Um, again, from this, um, improvements can be made. Um, then another section that is becoming increasingly important these days is the ability to demonstrate outcomes. Uh, and outcomes of care for patients in relation to not just the total team, but from a nursing perspective, well, what's the unique, we'll say, contribution of nursing within an emergency department? And how can that be quantified and measured so that you can then look at continuous improvement in that regard? And last, but by no means least within the framework or within the toolkit, uh, we have identified the importance of financial planning. So if you're looking at your staffing, you know, we're not, we're not deluded. We, we're, we are realistic enough to know that you have to do it within a financial envelope and a financial envelope that's available for you. And if you have identified from the other previous examination of the factors that you don't have enough staff, then by doing this in a systematic way, it helps you build your business case to take it to management within the organization. And um, so it's, it's really important to look at that aspect of it also. So within that, there's also a template to support uh, nursing staff within emergency departments in relation to a budget impact analysis. So looking at your whole activity and the impact that that has on your staffing. So finally, um, within this also, we have identified an education, pro uh, an ident an education program for staff who would be leading out on the workforce planning within the emergency departments. And it's to simply to help them facilitate the implementation of the framework. Within it, there are a number of units of learning, six attached to each of the different uh, sections of the toolkit that I mentioned before. There's aims and objectives for each of the units. There's core reading identified for each of the units from the, the best available evidence at this point in time. No doubt that in a couple of years' time, there'll be a lot more evidence that will be available to support that. So that will continuously need to be developed. Then within a workshop, there's, I suppose, an opportunity to play with the various templates and look at the examples that are within the framework. And then there's the opportunity to reflect. So in terms of the overall project, it probably started, oh God, I can't even remember the date, I think it started sometime in 2004. And although we're only launching it officially here today, it technically has been done for a little while. We've just been playing with the document, which has taken us a little bit of while just to I are not cross all the T's and dot all the I's, of which there were a few gaps. Um, but in terms of the governance, we identified a, a advisory group that Susanna chaired. Um, and from that had a wide range of membership, including nursing unions, um, so that it was uh, bought into, really. So I suppose in conclusion, we set out to develop a framework to support ED nurse managers, and I think we have developed that. We certainly have a thorough literature review uh, within the framework document. Uh, we have identified a, an approach that we think is evidence-based that you should all be able to use throughout the uh, various emergency departments. Uh, and I'd like to say that this was the product of real genuine um, co-design, including the active participation of a number of emergency departments throughout the country where we 
myself included, um, tested the various components of the framework and the toolkit. Uh, we then subsequently revised them, revised them again, and sent them out for evaluation to all the emergency departments uh, for their final content. So uh, in terms of the document itself, here we are launching it today. It looks like this. It's uh, wire bound for ease of access so that you can look at the various templates. Uh, it's glossy, it's colorful. Um, we don't have one for everyone in the audience because we're still tidying a bit of it up, but there are some available. Um, I would like to say that Fiona tells me that it will be put up on the Emergency Medicine Programme well, website probably after today so that everybody can have a, a soft copy of it. What we're also doing is developing the templates. We're designing those so that they're available electronically for every department so that you can get them quickly. Alternatively, you can photocopy the back of these, but you know what photocopies of photocopies get end up like. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to launch the framework document. Thank you very much. I'm telling Liz to hang on for some questions. I just want to acknowledge the huge piece of work that this has been, uh, um, which has been done by Liz, started by Una in the Emergency Medicine Programme. It's the first time there's ever been a framework document done standardising nursing roles in any specialty in Ireland. So um, just congratulations again to them finally launching their piece of work. So uh, I'm forcing Liz here to be available to take any questions we might have from the audience. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll be available for questions over uh, lunch if anyone has anything burning. Okay, last chance for any questions. If not, we'll go on to the next project. Okay, thank you, Liz. Rather than have Emily, <coughs> excuse me, rather than have Emily and I on the stage at the one time, in which case there would be a risk that it would have to be repeated in French. Uh, and look a bit like your vision, we've decided to do it sequentially. Um, I think what you'll see over the course of this morning is lots of examples of standardization. I mean, people from outside emergency medicine often have a view that emergency departments are chaotic, and, and clearly they have that potential. But I think you'll have seen from the human factors and the communication tools, you'll see from the uh, nursing workforce planning tool, you'll see from a lot of the other presentations this morning, the emergency medicine programs attempts to standardize things. Uh, so our next speaker uh, probably needs no introduction to this audience, uh, it's Val Small, and has been an advanced nurse practitioner in St. James's Hospital for many, many years. You know, in the old uh, Harry Moore at the top of da Dawson Street for more, care for more years than she cares to remember, but I think what she has brought to this is a huge experience and has been at the forefront of development of the role nationally, uh, a role that, that our current minister has been very taken by and has worked with us very hard to extend the role and make sure that it's available uh, all over the country. So Val is the Advanced Nurse Practitioner Lead on the Emergency Medicine Programme. Thank you very much, Val. slipped right through all of my slides. Um, thank you very much and good morning everybody. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I suppose many of you will actually have heard this presentation um, in various iterations, um, but I suppose there are some of you in the audience that may not be familiar um, with the role of advanced nurse practitioners either in emergency or in the, um, in the healthcare system itself. So I suppose by taking you through this project, I thought I would just put a bit of context around the A&P role itself. Um, have a look at the key objectives of the A&P strategy, which we developed uh, over the last two years. Um, look at some of the, I suppose, service activity and the current status of A&P roles at the moment. Have a look at the patient caseload and then um, just review the next steps. So I suppose the context um, around advanced nurse practitioner roles really um, I suppose this role was established in St. James's Hospital um, almost 20 years ago uh, this year. So Fergal wasn't too far off seeing him around the houses a few times. But myself and Professor Patrick Plunkett in St. James's looked at this role in 1996 and felt that it was, um, it was a good idea. 
basically. And we put together a, a pilot project um, with the help and support of senior management at the hospital. And very soon, uh, we came to realize that really it was well accepted by our nursing and our medical colleagues and, uh, and patients themselves appreciated it. Um, following on very quickly from what we were doing in, in, in St. James's, the Commission on Nursing uh, published its report in 1998. And within that, um, the role of the staff nurse, the manager role for nursing, uh, clinical nurse specialist roles and advanced practice roles were all identified and were recommended through this commission um, to support uh, nurses who wished, I suppose, in some cases to stay as clinical nurses at the bedside with the patient. And again, they, they described that pathway towards advanced practice. Um, in, I suppose, in regards to where emergency nursing and the advanced nurse practitioner role went over the next 10 to 15 years, it was actually variable. There wasn't really any joined up thinking about where the, the roles should, should take place. And I suppose really what we had what started in St. James's proliferated really, first of all, throughout the Dublin hospitals um, and then variably around the country. Um, and really, it wasn't until the emergency medicine programme came into being in 2011 um, under the clinical lead of Una Geary, um, and then the, with the production of the National Emergency Medicine Programme Strategy in 2012, that emergency nursing per se um, took centre stage, and in particular, uh, advanced nurse practitioner roles. So from the strategy, the National Emergency Medicine Strategy in 2012, it was um, seen as an imperative really to look and put together an A and P strategy that would, um, I suppose, determine where uh, advanced nurse practitioners in emergency nursing were going for the next four to, uh, to six years. So in June 2013, uh, following um, a project which myself and Susanna Byrne um, undertook, we, um, we looked at, uh, the key objectives that we looked at really in determining it, this strategy were to provide guidance on the optimum number and location of AMPs required in emergency departments and local injury units around the country. We also wish to standardise the role profile and the scope of practice. And again, just um, going back to what Fergal already said, um, we needed to really look at standardising what it was that our AMPs were actually uh, doing in terms of patient management and caseload. Um, we also needed to standardise our recruitment and education requirements um, and also support the continuous professional development needs of the established registered advanced nurse practitioners. Um, heretofore, again, I suppose ANPs were expected to be educated to master's level um, and obviously be deemed competent, competent in managing their, their caseload. Uh, but once that happened, uh, really, I suppose, there were there were very little um, by way of education pathways or continuing development pathways for the registered AMP. So again, we felt that this was really important for their own um, sustaining uh, and expansion to, to, to assist in the expansion of their roles. And also, when, while planning for a, these new services, um, we also need to look at sustaining these um, in, the, in the medium to long term, and also, I suppose, providing some career and succession planning uh, support for nurses that were coming into the area of emergency nursing. So at a glance, uh, here's our map. Um, the stars <laughs> represent all our advanced nurse practitioners in practice around the country. So as you can see, basically there's there are AMPs everywhere um, around the country, and they, 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 they do, I suppose, exist in larger numbers in the urban areas around, uh, around Dublin. Um, and in the more rural areas, we have some, some areas that require uh, development, in particular areas such as um, Bantry, um, which again, rural and remote um, areas such as, as these, um, they really do need, need some attention as we go forward. Other areas that are in development are in local injury units, in particular Dundalk, Roscommon, and St. Michael's in Dunleary. Um, and over the next few slides, I just want to take you through some of the, um, I suppose, capacity that we've, we've achieved, the capability, again, of our existing AMPs, and then have a look at the, at the caseload. So the capacity uh, at this moment in time, I'm, I'm very pleased to say, um, when we projected our figures we, and we did the workforce planning um, piece, we projected that we needed 150 uh, AMPs in order to staff our uh, emergency departments and local injury units. 
so, um, and we had a, in around 43 registered AMPs at the time that we published the, the, the strategy in 2013. So at this point in time, we now have 78 registered AMPs um, and uh, 25 nurses undertaking the education programme. That does leave us with a deficit of 52 nurses which you, whom we require to recruit, educate and put through the pathway. Um, uh, we have 33 established AMP services, as I said, out of 39 units. Um, and we, we have a standardised job description now for AMP in adult, adult and children, and, and in children. And HSC has adopted that, um, that job description for, for the future recruitment and employment of AMPs. We also contributed to, this, to standardising the AMP candidate um, uh, role, which heretofore we hadn't got a grade code for AMP candidate. And again, this is one that's going to be used nationally across all of the specialties um, of advanced practice, not just in emergency. Um, and we also established an AMP form under the umbrella of the Emergency Medicine Programme in order to continue to support our registered AMPs in um, professional development um, for education specific to their role and to their caseload, and in order as well to gather some national uh, data in relation to activity. Um, because again, uh, heretofore we had, we had no repository or no way of, of gathering any of this data, so uh, through the AMP forum we've actually started to collect that information now. Um, so the capability of our AMPs, really the role is changing, expanding and increasing in levels of complexity and responsibility, certainly over the, over the, the 20 years that I, since I've started this, this role. We have, um, we have authority and we have the education to support medicinal and uh, ionising radiation prescribing. Um, and more recently we have uh, prescribing of ionising radiation in children. In relation to service activity, um, in excess of 70,000 patients were actually managed by our a in 2015. So again, that's quite a sizable amount of patients um, that, who were managed purely from uh, uh, the perspective of an advanced nurse practitioner. The average, um, I suppose, of, uh, of the average figure of that uh, as, it, as, it, as it comes down to new patients and uh, in emergency department attendances is around 14 to 16% of total new attendances. The hours of service are mainly 8 to 8 p.m. at night, but some departments start later and finish later, some start slightly earlier. And the triage categories are mainly triage category 4 uh, and Manchester triage category around 60%, but other categories which are of a higher acuity, around, such as category 3, category 2, as you can see there, there, are, um, there is activity and there is scope and the scope is actually improve, increasing around managing those more complex patients. 90% of patients are seen within the recommended Manchester triage times, and the average time from consultation to discharge uh, is 52 minutes, with an average PET of, 30, of 93 minutes. Um, so that's for the patients that are being managed through uh, those scopes of practice. Now, you might wonder why there's a photograph of these guys with helmets on their head and little lights on, shining on the top. But I just wanted to put that up there as a, as a kind of a, a little taster. Um, some of my colleagues, my medical colleagues, uh, you know, really hate the term minors, and these are minors, uh, but not the type that we actually see. Um, and really, I suppose, we understand what we mean when we talk about the minor stream or minors patients or minor injuries. But what I'm going to show you in the clinical photographs that I have here is really you know, that the patients that we manage, there's nothing minor about them. They don't wear helmets, they don't, and they're also not under the age of 16. Many of them actually have what you and I would consider quite serious uh, injuries and conditions. So looking at the patient profile then, what do we see? So we see musculoskeletal injuries, and again, across the range from, from paediatrics right the way through the, the age continuum. Um, and again, obviously patients come to us uh, as a result of injuries when they're at leisure, when they're playing sport, and, uh, and also when they have recreational uh, injuries um, of a Saturday night. Um, we manage in the initial management of fractures um, and also contribute to ED fracture review clinics. And again, some of these, uh, and we work across the continuum. Um, many of my colleagues manage uh, children as young as 18 months um, who work in, in the, the dual adult and uh, paediatric departments. We also have three AMPs who work in the paediatric departments uh, and see from birth. Um, again, another slide uh, just to, to point out that we see head and facial injuries, and some of these certainly, uh, 
I wouldn't uh, think any of you would think fall into a minor category or uh, into a category that perhaps maybe patients could be diverted or should be seen elsewhere. Max Fax injuries, dental trauma, uh, soft tissue injuries, which, which accompany skeletal injuries. Um, and again, uh, you know, we manage quite a few and often quite a few in the day, uh, in, of a day, reduction of fractures and, uh, and dislocations. We manage soft tissue infections and we also manage quite complex uh, wounds. And again, um, many of these, as you can, as you probably agree, um, are certainly uh, not of a minor nature. We manage specific hand injuries, and also, I suppose it's it's uh, fair to mention that there is an expanding scope of practice that has started to emerge in a few uh, departments at the moment, and that's around looking at uh, medical and surgical conditions, um, non-cardiac chest pain. Uh, ENT presentations and uh, and hip fracture. This is really jumping all over the place on me. Um, uh, just I suppose a finish up really is um, for the next steps um, for this project. The next steps really are around the workforce planning, continuing that, linking in now with the workforce planning framework, um, and so that we can actually plan for our various departments and that we that, that plan will link in with the service need and the service needs analysis um, and with the, in the hope that um, we will actually reach the target of 150 AMPs and uh, and again just set about continuing that those services that are established uh, throughout the country so thank you very much for your time Any questions for Val? Sorry, I'm not trying to imitate Lord Nelson or something, but it's actually difficult to see into this light. Anyone? No? Okay, we're not getting away that lightly. He, she has to justify her attendance. Um, I suppose, I mean, when you showed the map, you showed a few places that have been very slow to embrace this. So how do you convince those that need convincing that they really need to move on this. I think those of us who have this service appreciate the value of it. The problem is those that don't have it don't really have anything that they can use um, to encourage them. Well, I suppose I'd have to say that the, the number of departments that don't have AMPs now is actually very small. Um, and where they don't have them, I, I'm not sure that it's... I, I think there's a combination of, 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 of factors um, and perhaps... Um, you know, there may not be the personnel that exist on the ground, there may not be the, the I suppose, support from maybe senior management. Um, it's rare to find that there isn't support from emergency medicine, I have to say. So mm -hmm. generally speaking, that that's, that's not the barrier. Um, but we are, I suppose, the more that the evidence comes out, the more um, we, we show the activity data. Uh, I suppose the more that we ourselves kind of promote the notion that it is... This is this is good team working, um, and that you know AMPs um, have their have their place as part of the team. Um, we're not trying to go out there and you know um, break off from and do our own thing as such. It, it is part of the approach that uh, as a team we we we, um, we support the patients as they come through the pathway or come through the our our departments um, as best we can um, as part of that team. Great, thanks very much again. Okay, moving on to the next presentation. Uh, we're going to have a presentation on Irish children's triage system. Um, as any of you working in emergency medicine know, um, the initial standardising the initial reception of both adults and children um, into the acute hospital uh, sector is is very important. Um, we've had we've long had a standardised reception system for adults, uh, the Manchester triage system, which is almost universally used in Ireland, uh, but today we're introducing uh, the, the triage system for the reception of children. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, to you Bridget Conway's, uh, Bridget Conway, who's going to speak to us today. Um, but uh, people who've been working on this project are both Bridget and her colleague, colleagues Ruth Devers and Mary Tomalty. Thanks, Bridget.
Good morning, everybody. We'd like to first thank you for the invitation to present on the Irish Children's Triage today. Uh, I'm presenting both for my two colleagues in both Temple Street Hospital and the National Children's Hospital in Tala, and also on behalf of everybody that was on the ICTS steering committee. So I suppose the first question to be asked is why did we need uh, an Irish children's triage system? There was already a system in place called Manchester Triage, which actually helped to triage patients as they came in. However, when we looked at it, we found it wasn't probably satisfactory for our patient population. What they had were generic triage tools. And when we started looking at it in 2011, there was actually only five pediatric specific tools available at that stage. So what we wanted to, what we took on was a quality improvement initiative and it was inspired by everybody who attended INIC in relation to the inadequacies as we uh, determined of the existing Manchester triage tool. So we looked at developing an evidence-based tool which incorporated many discriminators including vital signs and pain scores. Our ICTS aims to deliver consistent, reproducible triage so that this tool can be used in any emergency department in Ireland that actually sees children. So a little bit of the background. It started way back in 2011. It seems a lifetime ago now at this stage. And at one of our first INIG meetings, there was a presentation given as to the challenges that we have when we actually use Manchester for triage in children. So at that stage, we set up a, a steering group, and we initially did a literature review on all the existing triage tools. So what we found was Manchester was mainly general. There was no other pediatric-specific triage tool that we could actually find in Europe. However, the Canadians had developed a tool, but their timelines were different, and their layout and their systems were different for actually uh, assessing children. In, in, in the States, they used an emergency severity index, which really was more adult-based than what it was peds-based. So we set about setting up our own triage system, and we were going to base it mainly on the layout of the MTS, uh, because the Manchester triage tool would be used and continues to be used for adult patients in our adult settings. So we wanted to make it as easy as we possibly could for our adult, adult colleagues to be able to use the two tools. There were pa training packages developed and delivered by the CNM3s from all the three pediatric hospitals. And we decided we'd, we'd actually pilot the ICTS initially. So it was piloted across six sites. And I suppose a great thank you has to be given to the six sites that actually took part. <coughs> There was Temple Street University Hospital, Tala National Children's Hospital, Drogheda, Galway, and Cork University Hospital. So they identified champions within their staffing that would actually come and actually receive training, and, there, and we would be seen then to support them. So when we look at the, when we look at the it, for those who know Manchester, the color coding, the, the timelines for medical intervention, the maximum timelines for medical intervention are laid out exactly the same as MTS. And as I said before, that's to support our colleagues who actually work in general departments who see both peds and general. I suppose what was, what was unique to ours is when you looked at Manchester triage, some of the literature would say that over 50% of patients are over triaged on, on Manchester, and that carries a risk for patients if they're not actually appropriately triaged. Manchester, even though they would acknowledge what normal vital signs are, they actually couldn't give us any guidance as to when the patient, uh, patient acuity dependent on how abnormal the vital signs were. So as you can see from these very straightforward charts, down the left-hand side, it gives you an age range. In the middle, it gives what's acceptable and then the color coding on the charts is, is laid out the very same way as the Manchester triage is laid out. So not only do we use these within our, our triage rooms, but we also use them throughout the departments. So for the pilot phase, we decided we'd collect data in, in an effort to try and validate the tool that we'd actually developed. So ch the champions across the six 
named sites, collected data on the percentage of each uh, attendance of each patient presenting per triage category, the admission rate per triage category, and the triage categories of all patients that required a subsequent uh, intensive care ad a unit admission. There was also a st staff satisfaction questionnaire completed by the staff who acted on all six pilot sites. And post the end of the three month pilot, feedback was received from the champions who fed back all their colleagues' feedback, and this helped to, to form the revision of the ICTS. So just to have a little look at the audits, I suppose the point to make was it was introduced initially as a three month pilot, and then each of the six sites had the option to revert back to what they had been using pre the pilot. And it was very reassuring for us on the steering group that at no, none of the six hospitals reverted back. And this was great from an audit point of view of the actual data that presented as well. Because everybody continued, we actually were able to gather data and compare it from the year before we introduced ICTS to the year after. So it also included the seasonal variation that we would have had if we were only able to do it for three months. So anyone who knows me knows I'm the queen of graphs. Once I get onto the graphs, I'm home dry. So what we have on the left-hand side is the attendance per triage category, and they're done out in the color codes. So the red would be category one, orange would be category two, Yellow would be category three, four would be category, uh, green would be category four, and the blue would be category five. So as you can see, there was a huge variation. The one on the left-hand side is pre the ICTS. When we compare it to the one on the right-hand side, this is post the ICTS, there is a point to be made with this. All the information, nobody, nobody is aware, each hospital is aware of which hospital they are, but nobody else is aware of what the six hospitals are. But the first three hospitals on each of the graphs and the upcoming graphs are the general hospitals. The second three hospitals on each of the graphs are the pediatric hospitals. So you can even see across the three <coughs> pediatric hospitals the variation that there was pre the introduction of ICTS. This is having a look at the admission rates. So even though for the consultants in the room who feel very strongly triage is not a determinant of, of admission, what we would say on the flip side of that is there is a correlation between the more sick patients requiring admission. So when we look at them, there was huge variation in the first one with some hospitals having a higher percentage of admission for their CAT 3s than what they did of their CAT 2s. And this settles some... Uh, quite significantly after the introduction of the ICTS, as you would expect. Having a look at the patients who were admitted to the pediatric intensive care, I suppose the most worrying part is we had 2% of patients pre the ICTS who'd actually initially received a category four when they came in and subsequently ended up going up to intensive care. That had disappeared post triage and the category three presentation that subsequently required PICU had dropped from eight to six percent. So I suppose what we decided then was we'd review, look at the two, look at the ICTS and actually try and attempt to launch it nationally. So as I said previously, all the pilot sites requested to continue using the ICTS and never reverted back to their, their old triage system. There was support from the Centre of Children's Nurse Education and they really helped us to set up the study days and keep a record of everybody that was attending. The CNM3s did deliver train the train education sessions in five locations around the country in 2014. I suppose the strengths looking back on, on what we've been through is the train the trainer program I think was the key to the success down the, house, down the country and that the staff down the country knew at any stage that they could pick up the phone and actually phone any of the three pediatric units to get support at any stage. There was enthusiasm of staff from the very outset which actually identified that I think most people felt that the Manchester triage for children didn't address our needs. And post the pilot, we had six sites already trained who were available to provide that support to other sites. 
there's always challenges. So what our colleagues have fed back to us were the challenges when we went to do the national rollout was time constraints. So everybody's busier, the departments are busier, and there's quite a lot of education and support and supervision that actually is required initially on the rollout of this. One of our hospitals down the country has actually done their full training package, but unfortunately due to lack of IT supports haven't been able to introduce it as yet. As I think we're all aware, there are not registered children's nurses available for every shift down in the ED at all times. And even though we did try, the, unfortunately there was no available funding when we did go to roll it out nationally for a dedicated coordinator who could actually go and visit the sites to see what were the actual problems on the floor. And we feel that that may have been a support uh, to actually getting it fully across the line. On the flip side of that, a challenge that we didn't determine or didn't anticipate before we started the training was there are actually paediatric assessment units up in-house, up the hospitals, in a lot of hospitals, that were actually wanting to roll this out. And unfortunately, just for the moment, that we're anxious that it, the initial rollout just be for emergency departments, not that we get it out and get it successfully there first. So the next steps, it's not in every single department, is to continue to work, work through, identify, and actually help solve the, the hospitals who haven't currently been able to introduce the ICTS. We will look for resources to run an additional train the trainer day, and the hope is the ICTS will be launched as a document by the Emergency Medicine Program in the future. Thank you. So thank you very much, Bridget. Once again, just to um, make sure everybody knows what a huge piece of work this is. Uh, children, children's triage, um, as Bridget has said, is, is not standardized through uh, internationally. And to actually establish a children's triage it has been a huge piece of work. So congratulations uh, to all involved. Um, Bridget, can I ask a question? Um, I know there were some problems with integrating, as you know, our adult Manchester triage is integrated into our IT system. Um, can you tell us about how you've managed integrating children's triage into the IT systems around the, around the country? I think, I think probably what we didn't understand when we, when we started this voyage, because we will call it a voyage, it's been long, was that there were so many different variations of IT supports out there. So to be fair, when I showed you the graphs of some of the hospitals with the pilots, some staff actually went back and physically counted. So IT supports are, are so poor in some, of our, in some of the hospitals down the country that they're actually not even able to ascertain that information off a computer. <laughs> the flip side of that is, from, from an iPad point of view, we've been able to get it up. But if you use a different system, this needs to be inputted onto every single system. So unless you have a great IT system locally, there is no national rollout currently to actually put it up on the IT system. So one of our hospitals, as I said, even though all the staff have been trained and they're anxious to get it in, Manchester is up electronically and to ask their staff to actually use ICTS as a manual copy is just a step too far. So, as I say, IT support is going to be critical going forward. Any questions regarding children's triage? Okay, thanks very much, Bridget. I get the easy jobs. I have to introduce the people who don't need an introduction, which is great. Um, our next speaker is Fiona McDade, who uh, has been involved in the emergency medicine program since the beginning, and she's now the nursing lead for that. Um, I have to be really nice to Fiona, for, because my mother lives in the catchment area of the hospital. She's a substantive three and CNM3 pose. So Fiona, substantively, is a CNM3 in NACE, but she's going to talk today about the emergency department monitoring and clinical escalation process. Good morning and thank you. Um, so I'm just going to do a short presentation on the emergency department monitoring clinical escalation 
um, project for adult patients that we've been working on. And like many of the projects from the national program, it's been a fairly long journey. Um, the issue around the monitoring, the ongoing monitoring of patients in emergency departments um, was raised by the Emergency Nursing Interest Group um, in early on when, with, when the group was established um, in January uh, 2011 um, as something that we needed to look at and review to try and get some standardization nationally. Um, it's not that the monitoring wasn't being done, it's just that depending, it, there was too many um, variables and we felt that this wasn't good and um, when we started looking at the literature we found um, that uh, there has been a number of um, incidents around the world, not just in Ireland, where people unfortunately have deteriorated, um, going undetected or not early enough to detection. So um, we started working on this project in 2011, um, initially looking at what tools were out there. Um, and um, there was no specific emergency department tools. There's a lot of tools for inpatients, and we did initially look at well, could you adapt one of these or could you just import it? Um, and um, unfortunately, that wasn't going to be an option. So, um, this, so we started um, evolving our own tool. Um, there are on average about 1.2 million patients attending our emergency departments every year. So it's a large cohort of patients um, that we had to design a tool for. And then um, Hikwa Tala came out in May 2012 um, which also um, reinforced the work we were doing and, uh, you know, also um, reminded us that we were on the right path and it was something that we needed doing. Um, then uh, we did pilot studies in 2013. There's a HRB research um, project ongoing, which I'll talk about later. And we're currently on the National Clinical Effectiveness Gu uh, Group uh, priori prioritization list, which I'll talk about later on as well. Okay, so what is the protocol? It's um, a standardised monitoring approach uh, for all uh, adults in emergency departments, uh, which um, it's about 75% of the 1.2 million are this to will cater for. Um, it's to make sure that our patients are safer in our departments. And in the background that we have currently with the overcrowding and the borders, it's becoming... Um, even more challenging for us to keep our patients safe, um, especially with um, up to recently the moratorium where the staffing and the skill level um, was always a challenge. And the system is being designed so that it will align with um, the early warning score. And um, the, because of the way the parameters work on the um, IMU score, um, what we've, we've had to do a fix there. So what happens is that if the the um, lady is pregnant or within 42 days of delivering, then we use their actual um, uh, vital signs chart. So as with the, all, all the, um, these type of tools, there are five components to the tool. We have our observation chart. We have the process around the monitoring. We're using the ISBAR communication tool. We have um, patient-specific monitoring plans and then obviously the clinical escalation piece, which... Um, is essentially a, a national approach, but um, the final kind of layer of it has to be defined as per the local department because not all departments have like, consultants on call 24-7 and things. So there's, there is some tweaking that has had to be done. So why is it necessary? Um, because our, unfortunately our time to see the clinician f does occasionally, well, or frequently in some sites, fall beyond the um, guidelines that we use for our Manchester triage. So our triage twos, majority would get seen within the 10 minutes, but some people do fall outside that 10 minutes. Seeing the triage threes within an hour, the triage fours within two hours, and the triage fives within four hours is becoming um, increasingly difficult. Um, the triage ones, thankfully, we never have to worry about. Um, they are on their own pathway and uh, do uh, get seen within timely response. Um, so it's, um, you know, it, it's, it, it is quite challenging. And with all the patients that present to emergency departments, they are unique in that they're undiagnosed, they're undifferentiated, and they're of varying acuity. So it's been quite a challenge. Um, but the tool that we've got so far, um, we feel um, is, f um, 
something that the departments can work with. The, the part, we have piloted it on um, over 2,300 patients, and then there is the research project going on in Cork University Hospital, which sees somewhere around 70,000 patients a year. So it's, by the time we get to the, uh, the end of this year, it will have been very much tested. And as issues have arisen with the pilots, then obviously we've had to um, do some adjustments, but that's the whole point of doing the testing. So um, in May 2012, Tyler Hickwer uh, report came out, and it's st uh, one of the recommendations is that there has to be an ED specific physiological monitoring and triggered response are comparable to the news. And this, there is a, a lot of similarity between the news. Um, one of the things that we discovered with the piloting um, was that um, the parameters of the news, um, as you change into the different color bands, they were fine, but when you went to document stuff on the charts, um, like the temperature bands, um, we do see uh, adults coming in with temperatures of 41 because now with uh, so many oncology patients being in the community, it's quite normal to get people coming in with temperatures of 40. And the te although the news chart said you could document, um, you know, it's a greater than for above the 39 fives, we felt that it needed it a, a line dedicated itself. So to actually so you could see the very clearly the the reduction in the temperature as you progress. So the small um, uh, issues like that, um, and um, the the colours on the observation chart are the triage colours because that's the way um, we work and we think. So this is the process. So um, all patients will continue to be seen by the triage nurse, and they'll be triage signed appropriate uh, categories. The triage ones they get screened off the tool because triage ones do have designated resource pathways, and therefore they're one to one nursing. They're in a resource room and they're. Um, being looked after. The triage twos, they um, by definition should be seen within 10 minutes and we have, we are aware that on occasions that um, the patient isn't reviewed by the clinician within the 10 minutes. So if they do need to be reviewed to make sure one, um, are they still okay at a two? Do they need to be escalated? Do they need to be de-escalated? Or is there something else that we need to do? So the the, um, a lot of the triage twos as well, a lot of people thought that this is unattainable to get them reviewed in 10 minutes, but triage two, um, a lot of our patients are triage two because of pain. So by the fact that you've given them their pain relief, the, the review is actually, is the pain relief starting to take impact? So, um, so there's a similar system then for the triage threes, which are an increasing cohort of our patients. Um, over the last few years, we've seen the triage threes reign from about 40, 45% of our presentations up to most, a lot of departments now are looking at 65% being triage three. So that's a big change in our presentation. So it is a group that we are um, concerned about getting all the reviews done. Then triage fours uh, within two hours and triage fives uh, again are sieved off because by definition their complaint is more than a week and they don't have pain. Um, and then another filter we then subsequently put in was that patients who present with non-life-threatening injuries that do not require anything more than over-the-counter analgesia, they again are, uh, are sieved off. However, um, if during their stay in the department, they then require you know, stronger analgesia, then, then they then go on to the protocol. So um, there's quite a lot of uh, movement. Um, so th 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 this arrangement has come out through all the testing that we've done. So at the moment, um, we have been prioritised for the with the National Clinical Effectiveness Com Committee. Um, it, we're on a very uh, fast uh, whirlwind tour through their uh, documentation. We put the submission in in May of last year, and we were accepted for prioritisation, having gone through all their different channels um, towards the autumn of last year. So we've met with um, them on several occasions. There was a systematic review tender put out, and NUIG Galway have um, won that. So we're working with them to get the kind of the literature and um, economic reviews and things done through them. And we've got a guideline development group, um, which is based from the Emergency Medicine Programme, 
there's two halves to that. There's the working group, which um, kind of is overseeing the progress, and then the advisory group, which is um, feeding uh, information to the working group. The working group has been broadened out after our first advisory group to, because um, we felt uh, the uh, view of the advisory group was, it was a bit too narrow focused, so we're in the process of inviting more people on. Um, so we, uh, the systematic review is working away. They have to report by the end of next month. And then there's the consultation period going on during the spring and into the early summer. And we have to have the document into NCEC by um, the end of July for their external review. And we are hoping that after being on a very rocky road, often filled with potholes, that we're now on the motorway heading straight through to the Department of Health to get them um, their sign-off um, at the conference, which is towards the end of November this year, uh, where the document will be formally launched as a national clinical guideline um, and therefore will have the same standing as all the other guidelines. The PUSE, um, which was launched last year, and the NEWS, which is now actually on its first review, and the iNews. So, so, oh, one of the slides disappeared. Oh, there is, was a slide in there about the research project um, going that we're doing with Cork. Um, it's HRB funded. It's been, we, we got the funding in 2014. The project started last year and we'll, we'll, um, we'll report later this year. And it is actually um, testing the tool on its attendances for this year which um, are around 70,000. Uh, so that work is being done with Cork University Hospital Emergency Department, um, UCC and UCD, which we are very grateful for their assistance in developing of this tool, because there has been many people that have helped us out, and without them, we wouldn't have got this far. And um, the, the feedback from INIG, um, which is the nursing work stream, has been fantastic, because you can sense check, and it's very easy to sense check st stuff, um, around the country and get people's feeling. And we know that there's going to be staffing issues with the introduction of the tool. Uh, that was flagged very early on. It has already been flagged with the Department of Health um, and the HSC and the workforce planning tool that is being launched here today will actually help us um, with assessing each individual department for what um, uh, resources it will they will need to actually implement the tool. I mean, the, downs the upside of this is if you didn't have admits, then the resources that you're using in all your boarded patients actually would be used um, to review the patients. Because in a lot of the time, if you look at the statistics, the number of patients in the waiting room mirror the number of admits. So it's all about getting the flow. So if we can get the, the patients moved on to the right um, location, then you should have less patients waiting for clinician review, which reduces the resource required. But at the moment, we've... <coughs> We haven't got that exit block uh, resolved, so um, there is going to be resources required um, in all departments of varying levels. Some will um, need uh, maybe only an uplift of 0.5, but some of the departments will need maybe an uplift of two whole time equivalents um, to get the, the uh, reviews done in a timely manner. So, um, but hopefully by the end of the year, a lot of this will be resolved and now we have the workforce plan to we'll have that um, to actually do proper uh, analysis for each department um, because there isn't one size fits all here um, so it's um, a bit of work for everybody thank you yeah. um, okay it's an extremely complex issue and I suppose uh, it feeds back to the issue if the dysfunctionality of having admitted patients in emergency department, if that could be fixed, we wouldn't have to have a tool to actually assess the safety of people waiting in the waiting room, apart from very occasionally when we get surges of activity. And I suppose our need for a very specific tool which works in our unique context. Any questions for Fiona? Again, sorry. The, I know Nelson got blown up in 1966, but the, the image is with us forever, yeah? Just, just, just hang on a second, just for the mic. Just. 
Thank you, uh, Fiona, for a very interesting talk. Uh, Nigel Soldier from St. Vincent's Emergency. I was just wondering, and perhaps this is a question more relevant to the HRB group working with the, the Cork project. Um, uh, I find it, first of all, challenging to get buy-in with regards to triaging and, and all the associated paperwork that needs to be completed for, for assessing such patients. But what are the group using to assess um, or to demonstrate the benefit of, of this re-triaging and, and reassessing odds on these patients? Uh, in other words, are we looking at number of patients going to ICU or looking at mortality benefit or, or is there an outcome that, that we're looking to, to show a benefit from? Yeah. Um, the, Cork, the Cork project is looking at part of its review is the number of admissions to un, un, unanticipated admissions to intensive care. That's one of them. Um, and it actually, is Steve? Uh, oh, a Abel is part of the research team. He can possibly explain the finite details a bit further. Yeah, so, so that's uh, an excellent question, uh, Nigel. And uh, there's been a lot of um, work going on over the last uh, probably six months just to decide on the outcome measures um, to determine the effectiveness of the tool. Um, so we've just completed a Delphi consensus process, um, which involved, I think, roughly about 60 uh, people around the country to decide on what outcome measures should be used. Um, and yes, sort of timely admission to ICU is, uh, is sort of one of the outcome measures. Uh, but there's a whole range of outcome measures, I think, roughly about 30. Uh, we need another meeting shortly to decide on the final suite of outcome measures uh, to use for the project. Any other questions? All right. Okay, Grace, thanks very much. Okay, moving on. Uh, the next presentation is about mental health uh, triage um, in emergency departments. Uh, the reception of mental health patients um, in EDs is, I suppose, a subject close to my heart, ha having stood in the coroner's court in Dublin and given witness to the tragedy of um, seeing a family who had lost a son uh, to suicide, and also the tragedy for the nurse uh, in our department that had triaged him before he left the department um, to hang himself. So mental health triage is a, a really qu quite a, a difficult area for our nursing colleagues. And I know Sinead uh, Lardner is going to talk to us about uh, a tool to support our nursing colleagues in, in triaging these patients. Sinead is somewhere behind me. There you go. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Emily, for the introduction. You're all very welcome. And thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Um, Post-triage mental health tool is exactly what it says in the tin. It is to be used after Manchester triage has been used on the patient. Um, I'm going there. Okay, where did this come from? The Emergency Nurse Interest Group is a very busy and active group um, that has a massive representation of mostly every emergency department in, in the Republic. And one of the issues that came up time and time again was our, man, our mental health patients that present to our emergency departments can prove difficult to manage because it's very rare that we have um, a registered psychiatric nurse on your team that day or that time. And I suppose one of the other issues that comes up is that they rarely present within hours where our services at the moment are Monday to Friday, nine to five. The majority of our patients rock up on Thursday evening, Friday evening, or at night time. So the ENIC group identified that, once again, Manchester triage is great for what it does. It gives you that initial prioritization, but what happens after that? Um, for those of us, including myself, that are not mental health trained, what do we do with these patients after we do the initial Manchester triage? And we didn't feel that the Manchester triage was sufficient on its own to identify and assess these patients where we didn't have mental health support at that time. So the aims and objectives of this tool was to increase the confidence and competence of the emergency nurses in risk assessing mental health patients post-triage. We wanted to identify issues and obstacles that ED nurses encountered in relation to mental health. And those obstacles that arose, alcohol, drugs, um, aggression, lack of resources within the department, and in a lot of cases, lack of staff. I mean, almost every department in the country is short-staffed all of the time. 
and we wanted to identify what the nursing staff actually expected this tool to deliver and to develop a tool that would assist staff in assessing mental health patients. How did we do it? Um, we, through ENIG, we did a search as to was there any tools at that time being used. And we identified that there were two tools. There was the clinical prioritisation tool in Cork, and Vincent's were using their own tool based, based on the Victoria tool. <coughs> we initially piloted the clinical prioritisation tool in two sites, and the, one of those sites had on-site mental health um, facility, and the other site didn't. The feedback from that initial tool was, it's great to have a tool, it's great that there's some guidance there, but we don't have anything to put into the patient's chart to determine why we delivered that care, why we did or didn't put that supervision on the patient. So we came back to the drawing board through ENIG and we looked at our second tool, which was being used in Vincent's, and they kindly let us adopt it. Um, and we, looked, we piloted it in three sites throughout the country. Three sites, one was a Dublin hospital, one was a hospital in the northeast, and one was a hospital in the west. And I must say thanks to everybody in those three sites. They were more than um, helpful to us. So before we started, we gave out pre-staff um, surveys. And one of the main things that we were looking at was to assess the nurses' comp own competence and confidence <coughs> in assessing these patients post-triage. The results of that initially told us that less than 40% of staff were moderately are less than moderately happy in confident, should I say, rather than happy, confident in assessing these patients. Um, one site had a psychiatric nurse on their staff, coincidentally, um, and as he's a registered general nurse as well, he was quite happy and comfortable in dealing with these patients. I, I myself wouldn't be. So the pre-survey really did show us that there is a lack of confidence in dealing with these patients, and there's probably a lack of guidance in a lot of areas as well. Um, of note, the post-staff survey on assessing their confidence in assessing these patients was greater than 86% of, of nursing staff were happy <coughs> using this tool. It increased their confidence from moderately to high. Um, we also looked at what times the patients presented at and what days they presented at. And I suppose my thinking was that Friday always seems to be the busiest time. A bus pulls up and we have a lot of issues within the department on a Friday evening. It was actually Thursday turned out to be the biggest day of presentations. Um, and there were probably reasons for that. So how, what did we want the tool to look like? Well, first of all, we wanted the tool to, again, like Fiona and Bridget said, correlate with the Manchester triage tool. The same colour system was used and the same um, time to be seen by a clinician was used. We um, evaluated how many of our patients that were included in this study, how many actually did correlate with Manchester triage. So out of our patients, there was 200, just about 230 patients, greater than 90%, I think it was 92% actually had the same cat or colour category, Manchester triage and post-triage mental health categorisation. The reasons why they didn't, um, when we looked into the individual cases, was that behaviour had either escalated or de-escalated of those patients that had presented. So what we wanted was a tool that is easy to use, um, that tells you quite quickly at a glance what your next steps should be, and also that can be kept in the patient's uh, medical record for future reference. As Emily did say, we are more and more seeing ourselves as nurses in the coroner's court, and documentation is sometimes the only thing we can rely on because of the time lapse. So we came up with a tool that had a triage category, and what you're looking at is the typical presentation, how these two um, patients present. The majority of our patients that we see, a bit like Manchester triage, generally if they're category two or category one, they're seen and dealt with quite quickly. It's our category threes and fours that we um, struggle a bit, to, or quite a lot in cases, to attend to in a timely fashion. Um, in mental health, our category two and category one patients are generally seen very quickly because they're very acute stage, they can be very disruptive to the department through no fault of their own, and they're generally seen very, very quickly. It's again our category three patients. But uh, more and more we're seeing as our staff shortages, we have a lot of junior nurses. I mean, it's unusual to have a day where all your ED nursing team are senior nurses. We're seeing more and more junior nurses, which is great to see, and middle grade nurses. And these are nurses that are in triage, and they may not necessarily have encountered that many uh, mental health patients. So we need a safety net for them as well. So we 
are divided into what they see when they're talking to the patient and what the patient reports themselves. And that's under the typical presentation. Now, obviously, there are atypical presentations. But for example, the category three, is the patient agitated and restless? Is there intrusive behavior? Or are they not likely to wait for treatment, which can be a big problem with these patients? Um, are they withdrawn and not communicating? And you basically tick which of those you have seen and assessed yourself. And what the patient themselves tells you. I mean, we're great at looking at things. Sometimes we're not the best at listening to what the patient themselves are saying. So what they have reported, are they reporting suicidal ideation, delusions, or thought disorders? And you tick those and sign it. And it also, Manchester Triage probably would have got us almost that far, but it didn't tell us what to do next. And that is where the emergency department procedure, and the very right side of your slide, is what do we do next? What does this patient need now in the emergency department while we're waiting for mental health to come? So do they need supervision? Um, where should we um, locate these patients? Or what do we need to do? And for instance, in this category, um, remove equipment from cubicles. You know, there's possibly a high risk of um, self-harm there. Um, and what do we need to do? So as a staff nurse, you need to tell the shift leader or CNM2. Um, you may need to tell the ED medical staff you, if you're within hours or you're lucky enough to have a psychiatric liaison nurse, you need to tell them. Um, and all the other bits that you need to do yourself as a guidance, what happens next. So how do we document all this? Oh, that's all right. So this is the second part that comes in. It's actually on the back of that care plan. And this is the documentation slide. Because we're um, possibly not as confident with mental health patients, we tend to write an awful lot so that we write everything that we're doing. And it takes a lot of time, and sometimes we lose time in dealing with the patients. So we wanted some document we could put into the chart that would record everything quite quickly. So I'm not sure if you can see that very clearly, but most places have the um, patient identity stickers, and they go on to this. They go on to every document that you use for your patient, but they go on to this. It tells you what the patient's Manchester triage category was and what their post-triage mental health tool category was. Um, and who triaged the patient. Um, and what you did next, did you call security? And if you did, what time and who it was? Did you tell your nurse manager? And so on and so forth, down, right down to your psychiatrist. Um, where they are in the department. Now on this document, it's no noted as zone one, zone two, zone three. I am, and we are very much aware, each department has their own um, identifiers within their department, so that can easily be changed. Um, who was the nurse looking after that patient and when or if were they handed over to another nurse if it's change or shift or the patient was transferred to a different area. Um, and a brief then past medical history, have we looked for their um, healthcare record, um, have we liaised with their GP, have we contact or do we know who their next of kin is? And then right down to the supervision that's required. What they needed um, and what time it was started at and who gave it, was it a nurse, a carer, or security? And of note, one of our pilot sites, in fact, our Dublin site, which did see the most mental health patients in the time they were piloted, um, one of the, as Bridget's words, flip side was, um, they actually noted a decrease in the amount of healthcare system specials they required on the foot of this tool. It was an unexpected resu result from this tool. It wasn't initially what we were looking at, but it was a reported benefit of it, with no adverse reactions to any patient that um, the tool was applied to. Um, not, uh, we are aware not every area or department has security. Um, and if there's any change in supervision, did their escalate or in, in behavior increase or escalate or de-escalate? The sedation given piece, now that there's a guide that comes with the tool and it's, um, I have a few with me if anybody wants them. It gives you a guidance as to how to do each piece of the tool. But the sedation piece is as per your own local policy. There's quite a variation in different um, departments. So you go by your own local area. But if it was used, how it was used and how it was given. And one thing we're not great at is documenting the discharge or outcome for that patient. So we have a tick box system in here for us. So were they admitted and where were they admitted to? I mean, we all have the issue with they need medical clearance before we can see them. So did they need that? And you can tick it. Were they voluntary or involuntary? And I suppose more and more we're seeing more involuntary patients coming to our department out of hours. And if they went home, where they went to, was their next of kin informed? Um, at the time on one of the sites where we had been, it was probably timely where we piloted it because they had had two patients who had been 
treated quite well by their emergency staff, but there was a big delay in psych seeing them and they left without being seen with fatal outcomes. And so it was a timely um, time to pilot in that department because obviously the staff were quite distressed about this. They had done as much as they could within their scope. So what happened? Where did we send them to from the emergency department? Um, and we do have time for the guard that you have to be called. So that's also documented there under the outcome um, section of it. Um, we, throughout the, all the pilots, this tool was very much um, a very positive feedback from all the staff that was used. It's been released as a guidance document because as we can see very clearly from Fiona's um, travel through her uh, get to a guideline, it takes quite a long time. And this was a tool that the ENIG members themselves felt needed sooner rather than later. Um, with the resource problems that we're having, our mental health patients can sometimes suffer as a result. We don't have a lot of senior staff. And this is a safety net tool for our nursing staff within the emergency department and our pre and post surveys quite clearly demonstrated that, which was great to see. Um, and that's me. I would like to very much thank our pilot sites that let me visit for uh, a long time to their departments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sinead. Can I just say, um, I mean, our nursing colleagues in emergency medicine are really leading the way in the emergency medicine program. And just uh, to say thank you very much to them all. Um, they've really been pushing uh, the, the standards regarding um, our patient care. So any, any questions for Sinead? Thank you. Can you just wait for a mic? Just give us one second. We have medical students here today. We have to make use of them. <laughs> Hello, Julie Keneally, I'm GP liaison in, in St. Vincent's Emergency Department. I'd just like to ask you how much like the, the MIT tool um, that we use there currently this is and what extra that gives uh, maybe a little bit more with regard to the outcome of the patient. Um, the tool we initially um, borrowed from Vincent's included the sad person score. Um, and we piloted the initial tool in one of our sites with the sad person score and recent research and feedback from the staff themselves all preferred that the sad person's tool wouldn't be used. So we took it out after that. Um, and in fact, research, the latest research would say it's of no benefit really to have um, and to apply to these, this cohort of patients. Um, sorry, I've just forgotten the second part of your question there, Julie. Just um, I, apart from what's already on the MIT and taking out the sad person score, score. Um, what extra this has brought to it? Very little. Um, what you're using in Vincent's is more or less what's here with the sad person's taken out. And the biggest benefit of this and your own tool is the documentation within the chart and almost a flow chart of what you need to do step by step for these patients. So there's very little as opposed to what you're using in Vincent's, which you kindly allowed us to adopt to the, through ENIG. Thanks, Julie. Anything else? Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much, Sinead. Thank you. Okay, our uh, final speaker of this session is Rosie Quinn. Rosie is a clinical physiotherapist specialist uh, in Our Lady of Lourdes Hospital in Drada and has been a member of the emergency medicine program since its inception. So. I think we all deserve some therapy, but I'm not sure what you have in mind. And I'm not sure what is needed for you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. The presence of therapies in the emergency departments is slowly and steadily rising. Historically, therapies received referrals from consultants and NCHDs, and these referrals were tri triaged by the appropriate disciplines and placed on waiting lists. In response to increased outpatient waiting lists, inappropriate and often unnecessarily, unnecessary referrals, and the recognition that prevention is better than cure, physiotherapy and occupational therapy services began to change, with some hospitals having a dedicated therapy service within ED. Furthermore, sorry, with international and national recognition of professional autonomy, and the therapy's clinical expertise in assessment, diagnosis, treatment and advice, triage and onward referral, emergency departments introduced regular therapy input, thus improving skill mix 
ultimately improving patient care. Suggestions of therapy-led therapy clinics, therapists as first-line practitioners, and improved referral pathways to reduce the burden of MSK presentations to ED began to evolve. One example of this which continues uh, is the effectiveness of low back pain management by services in Beaumont, called the BRAT, and in James Connolly Memorial. Furthermore, referrals from advanced nurse practitioners and shared care of MSK presentations in our ambulatory or minor care injuries began to emerge and enhance better patient care. However, around this time, the landscape in emergency departments changed dramatically. In order to address fluctuating medical and nursing staffing levels, as well as the increase in attendances, any potential therapy resource was redirected towards trolley weights, boarded patients, and improving patient experience time. A new cohort of ED presentations needed to be addressed. Hence, new therapy initiatives, many with no additional resources, were introduced to address the key issues of admission avoidance, discharge planning, and improved patient care. As staffing levels were overstretched, MSK and our minor injuries initiatives led by therapies were forced to take second priority in many places and failed to be introduced in many other settings. An example of the time frame and skill mix of a progressing ED service may be illustrated in the therapy services that have taken place in Our Lady of Lourdes Hospital in Drogheda. In 2005, a pilot was initiated comprising of six hours clinical specialist grade to scope the service to determine how best to address patient needs. The remit then was to attend the ED review clinic um, setting. Slowly and steadily, the service grew and regular audits were carried out to illustrate the effectiveness and benefits to both patients and staff. Soon, it was recognised that physiotherapy was an essential part of clinic hours and a fast or physiotherapy assessment and treatment service in ED was emerging. A further audit to determine needs for low back pain management and mobilities with the potential for same day discharge under the governance of consultants in emergency medicine was successful in securing a senior whole time equivalent physiotherapist in 2010 when we know there was no staff available. Services continued to expand with, with further changes within ED as many medically admitted patients required therapy intervention. This cohort of patients proved most challenging and time consuming and the necessity of the MDT team was essential. Vital services within ED of our nursing and consultants were necessary to drive and support these new initiatives to be introduced. So therapy in ED, where should we place them? Who should be within the remit of therapies and why should we be there? There are many current initiatives in many departments that are both interdisciplinary and inter-programme driven to improve quality, access and cost. It is important to stress that many of these services have been inherently cost neutral. However, despite recognition of their values, therapies are ultimately overstretched and can no longer sustain this on a cost neutral basis. Furthermore, there's a huge disparity in terms of access nationally to the various therapies in ED, which also now requires further attention and support. Internationally and national, nationally, therapies have been recognised to play a, pro, a role within emergency departments. Therapies in ED is no longer a thing of the past, and recognition of its value has been proven in local audit and in staff and patient satisfaction. Individually, these local audits make a difference, but collectively, they can make a huge difference to quality of care, appropriate access, 
and cost savings. One size doesn't fit all, so now we require a body of work to address workforce planning, case and sk uh, skill mix and pro professional profiles to implement an equitable therapy service nationally. Further work is also required to support recognised and agreed clinical pathways to avoid admissions, to encourage therapy and joint therapy ANP-led clinics to uh, unload the services in our musculoskeletal and consultant-led clinics, and therapists as first-line practitioners. The importance of appropriate skill mix in, in emergency departments is crucial to optimise better patient care. We must balance patients' needs with appropriate staffing level skills, ensuring we have the right person in the right place at the right time. The message for today from Therapies is, in this important mix, everyone deserves a little therapy. Thank you. Any questions for Rosie? Um, she generally acts as a useful counterbalance in some of our more revved up arguments when she often, at the emergency medicine program, when she kind of says, well, so what? Does that really matter? Uh, so she's, and we certainly in Sligo have some elements of that service and we would love to move to the next stage. I suppose maybe the question is, how do we do that? Mm. You know, we, like ironically, we, we have a superb musculoskeletal physiotherapist, but she sees people for us, you know, by appointment and gives us a fabulous service, but there isn't, from a hospital perspective, there isn't any enthusiasm to move the whole thing forward to, to the model that you've described. So I'd be interested in your thoughts on how you might achieve that. Yeah. And I think it's probably something that the therapies need to work on as well. I believe we probably feel that we need more support um, from senior management. We definitely have the support from the emergency medicine consultants and our uh, nursing staff. I think we need to start small and collect our audits and uh, promote our services that are effective as well. Um, I think as well we need two, courts of ma two cohorts or there's four different areas that we look after and we have to be clever and clear on how we manage them. There is the musculoskeletal um, cohort, the ambulatory care and the review clinics that can all reduce uh, fracture clinic attendance, orthopaedic clinic attendances, admissions um, and uh, improve patient care and that's a huge area that we can do. There are also those with the... Um, the admitted, pa no, the patients under consultants emergency medicine that have, have a potential for same day discharge. And they are a hu huge cohort that we improve. We reduce um, admission, and any admission reduces costings. Um, one of the examples that I didn't use was a lady who um, uh, presented to the emergency department, a 73 year old lady following a fall. And um, she uh, clinically presented with a conservative management of inferior pubic rami and a rotator cuff injury. She also had other medical comorbidities and she was, on, as far as the medics were concerned in ED, she was not safe for discharge. We tried to hand her over medically, but because she was medically stable, she was not um, accepted under medics. She was not accepted under orthopaedics either because she had conservative management and did not need any active orthopaedics. And she was left under the care of our consultants emergency medicine. Therapies came in and looked after her, uh, accessed a wheelchair for her um, within an hour, um, spoke with her family to make sure that there were services available with bedroom downstairs that she could move into her daughter's house for three weeks and then follow on review. We didn't send her on forward to fracture clinic or orthopedic clinic and she was managed for six weeks under the um, management of our physiotherapy services. Um, this was probably late November, um, early December. She came in to me yesterday and is happy to go back driving and is now living back on her own. So savings in care, but also patient satisfaction is huge. So if we get the, probably our, our if we get our um, examples as well as our audits and our numbers out there, we can really make a difference and improve patient care. Thank you.
that's a very good example, I suppose, of you know, uh, patient-centred care as opposed to specialty-centred care, which, unfortunately, you know, that scenario where nobody wants the patient but the patient needs a service is all too familiar to us. Any last questions? Yes, uh, one of, who's our roving mic person just behind you? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to follow up on, on the point um, just being discussed there. Um, I'm Fiona Keoghan from Beaumont Hospital and uh, we have a poster here today just around an initiative we started in September. Um, we're calling it our FIT team, it's our frailty yes, intervention it's therapy yes. team and it's mentioned there but yes. it's just I suppose to highlight um, that the frail elderly are probably the group that we can make the biggest impact on. Um, a lot of the other things are covered in lots of other ways but the frail elderly aren't really and uh, in the UK, there's a lot of work going on in frailty, and uh, I suppose we're, sh we're seeing in Beaumont that we can make a huge difference to that population because um, of the skill set that we have, but we don't tend to base ourselves in ED all the time. Yes. We need to be present all the time, and we need to, I suppose, broaden our roles to try and take on all that that involves. So we have a very basic um, data um, now in terms of what we're able to do, but we are... Um, I suppose we're very confident that it's definitely something that makes a huge difference to patient care. So it's just to um, mention that particular patient population. Thank, Thank you. you. And there are many other um, huge examples that have been continuing with multidisciplinary. Some of them are inter-programme related and, and some of them are interdisciplinary. Our service is based in ED and we only cover ED patients. However, the newer styles and the newer initiatives that are coming in are covering the cohorts of AMAU, short stay, and those with um, discharge within three days planning. And probably a lot of those new initiatives have been give allocated some staff, but the older initiatives started working on little small pilots, showing their value and their worth and adding from them. But there are many huge examples around the area that were mentioned and should be acknowledged. Some of them, I probably should say as well, um, although we talk about interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary, we need a huge amount of work um, to determine what that balance should be. Uh, recent statistics from rapid um, assessment is that 90% of them uh, have required physiotherapy intervention, um, whereas beforehand it was only se uh, 50 to 70%. All of, some of the teams require all services, other serve, um, hospitals, and the, the examples that I've shown you up here are only Model 3 and Model 4 hospitals. We haven't addressed what is required for the level or what is um, even evident or present in our Model uh, 2 hospitals. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Rosie, for that. Can, no oh, sorry, is there one Hi. Um, good morning. Thanks very much for the presentation. Thank you. Um, just, there's been a lot of good presentations this morning on um, initiatives that are looking at building towards national programs. This is a fantastic program that has benefits in every hospital it's in practice in. Is there any uh, look uh, amongst the emer emergency medicine program about rolling out a national uh, program with regard to the frail pathway? Yeah, there's, I mean, there is some work started on, I mean, the issue of the elderly and elderly care is an enormous issue. I think we'd all accept that. So we have started on some joint working uh, with the older persons program. Uh, and the first output of that is work on delirium. Um, so that process has started. I mean, we're going to look at syncope and other things. It's an enormous body of work. I mean, the one comment I would make is that our, our interaction with the uh, older persons program has been very constructive. They, you know, they have a number of ideas. We're trying to make sure that they're sense checked for an emergency department environment as opposed to what you might do in a ward, which is a completely different environment. Uh, but that work has started, and, and the first outcome, out, output of that uh, is on delirium, and that has been circulated. So you should either have seen that or it's coming your way. But it is an area, I think, for, for further work, um, and an important area for further work, given that's our death, that's about the only other thing that we're guaranteed is to get old. <laughs> well, you have a choice. <laughs> you can, um, okay, I'm going to bring this session to a close. I think what you've all seen 
um, is an enormous amount of work that is both nationally important, but to be fair, internationally important. Something, for example, like the uh, National Children's Triage Scale will be something that other countries will use. Likewise, I think other countries will use the monitoring and clinical escalation tool. And I think that just shows how much initiative, competence, enthusiasm, commitment uh, resides within the emergency medicine and emergency nursing communities. And sometimes that's lost. Now, I know I do spend a lot of time talking about trolleys and the associated issues, but I also recognize, both from my own department and elsewhere, is that there's an enormous amount of phenomenally good work takes place within, uh, in, uh, within our emergency departments and among both those working in emergency departments and, and those other services in the hospital, which often is not acknowledged and recognized. But I think you'll have seen from the presentations this morning, you know, the, how good some of that work is. So on your behalf, and on my own behalf, and Emily's behalf, I want to thank our speakers uh, for fascinating presentations on important subjects. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Right, we're moving on to the next um, agenda. I uh, say the next item on our agenda, and I'm going to be in. I'm pleased to introduce to you um, Abel Wakai. Uh, just to say, immediately after this session, we will be um, going on to lunch, which I understand is this direction. Um, so, if we can make our way out there uh, for lunch after this. So, um, Abel Wakai is going to speak to us about a clinical guideline development. Um, the Emergency Medicine Programme works closely with the um, Irish Association of Emergency Medicine on developing clinical guidelines for care. And the Irish Association of Emergency Medicine is the clinical advisory group for the Emergency Medicine Programme. Abel Wackai was the chair of the academic committee of the IAEM, the Irish Association of Emergency Medicine, and is now chair of the clinical guidelines group for IAEM. He's also a, a consultant um, in emergency medicine in Beaumont Hospital. So if we can introduce uh, Dr. Wackai. Um, thanks, Emily. So um, uh, essentially, I'm going to talk about the guideline development process within the Irish Association uh, for Emergency Medicine working with the National Emergency Medicine Program. Um, I'm just going to give you some background context um, to clinical guideline development between IAEM and the EMP, um, the principles behind the work that we do, uh, the terms of reference of the Clinical Guidelines Committee, its membership, uh, the whole guideline development process, and some future developments, and wrap up with some take-home messages. Um, we're really guided in the work we do by the definition of what a clinical guideline is from the Institute of Medicine in the United States, uh, which uh, defines clinical guidelines as systematically uh, developed statements to assist practitioner and patient decisions about appropriate health care for specific clinical circumstances, in this context, the emergency department setting. Um, the history of this, I must pay uh, sort of homage to Professor Ronan O'Sullivan, uh, who was previously chair of the Academic and Research Committee and really got this up and running. Um, guideline development uh, within IAEM was previously managed by the Academic and Research Committee, but uh, because of the volume and the clinical importance um, of clinical guidelines in this day and age, um, in October 2014, it became necessary to create a standalone uh, committee for this work, and that's the committee that I chair at the moment. The principles are really to improve the quality of emergency department patient care, increasing the likelihood of desired outcomes in ED patients, and make sure that the clinical guidelines which are used in emergency departments are consistent with uh, best current evidence and current uh, professional knowledge. In terms of, in terms of reference, uh, we use agreed IEM criteria to quality assure all the guidelines. Uh, we disseminate a template um, to anybody who is interested in working with IEM uh, to develop national emergency medicine guidelines. 
Uh, we also recommend and endorse other guidelines or best practice statements or guidance documents uh, uh, developed by other relevant stakeholders uh, for use within the emergency department setting. Uh, we ensure there's a timely update for published um, clinical guidelines. Clinical guidelines are only as good as the best current evidence that they contain, so it's really important that that evidence is kept up to date. And we really believe in sort of collaboration with other relevant stakeholders um, in terms of implementing um, guidelines um, to, uh, for use by frontline emergency department staff. We report to the IEM um, executive. Um, the current membership, we have five members, the four consultants in emergency medicine, and uh, a specialist registrar in emergency medicine who's a trainee representative. Uh, we, we take a really participative uh, bottom-up approach to the guideline development process. Uh, so it starts with um, a guideline which has usually been implemented in one emergency department, and the local guideline developer or developers then submit the guideline to, uh, to our committee. Uh, we then review it for its validity, its acceptability, and its practicality um, in the context of implementing it at the national level in all emergency departments. And if we agree that it's worthwhile pursuing, we then work with the local guideline developer or developers um, to make sure that the guideline is consistent with the IEM uh, format. Um, the draft guideline is then sent to all IEM members for feedback comments. And once we receive those feedback comments, we then work again with the guideline developer uh, to address the members' comments before the guideline is published. Another source of the guidelines that we develop is from the College of Emergency Medicine. Um, so the guideline we're working with at the moment is uh, an emergency department guideline to prevent the development of deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism in patients who have a lower limb cast or um, lower limb immobilization of any sort because of an injury. There are a couple of high profile cases in the United Kingdom of patients developing DVTs and PEs after their limbs were immobilized uh, in the emergency department and that drove the College of Emergency Medicine about four years ago to develop a national guideline in the UK. So obviously there's an NHS context and flavor to that guideline. So at the moment we're working on an IAM guideline on the same topic. Uh, which reflects the sort of Irish uh, setting. Um, this is just uh, an overview of the published um, guidelines which are currently uh, on the website and I think have been disseminated quite widely. Um, and the most recent one was a guideline on the use of tranexamic acid um, in trauma patients which was published just about two months ago. It's absolutely crucial for the validity of any recommendations that a guideline con uh, contains um, that the evidence is really up to date. Uh, so in that context, we aim to update our guidelines every two to three years to make sure that they are consistent with best current evidence. And these guidelines uh, listed here um, are due for update this year. Um, so the new guidelines in the pipeline, as I said, what, the one we really hope to wrap up next is really the thromboprophylaxis ambulatory trauma patients who require lower limb immobilization. Uh, we're also working on having all published IAM guidelines um, on mobile phone apps. Uh, we're hoping to wrap up this work uh, last year, but there have been some uh, technical and sort of intellectual property issues we, we're working through at the moment. So we're hoping within the next uh, few months to, to have that sorted out. So all the published guidelines will be available on, on mobile phone apps. Um, until quite recently, there wasn't any sort of international consensus of how you can develop performance measures based on, um, on guidelines. Um, so this is just hot off the press about two weeks ago. There's now sort of international consensus of how you can develop performance measures uh, based on guidelines. So we hope to um, to adopt this for all IEM guidelines that the publication of each guideline will be accompanied by some guidance on, on how you can use uh, the guideline to monitor performance um, in your department. Um, so really in terms of take home messages, as you can see, we really depend on 
local guidelines. Essentially, we bring local guidelines to the national level. So it's really a participative sort of bottom-up approach. We depend a lot in terms of the validity and the practicality of the guidelines on uh, end user feedback. So those who are using the guidelines um, uh, you know, for frontline patient care, uh, we welcome that feedback. Uh, we also welcome any sort of cross-specialty or interagency stakeholder involvement. So for example, our published guideline on the management of patients with um, implantable converter uh, defibrillators, uh, we developed that with the Irish Heart Foundation. Um, so if there are any other relevant stakeholders in the audience that you have uh, guidelines or ideas that you think might be relevant as a guideline for the emergency department setting, we certainly welcome uh, working with you. Um, so I just finished by thanking you and I always use this slide again because we really depend on local guidelines uh, for our work, um, for you to submit any ideas or local guidelines you have and that's the email address to send it to. And thank you very much. very much indeed, Abel, for speaking to a very, very important topic. Are there any questions for Abel? Looks like you're released, but can I just emphasize, this is hard work. This is very painstaking. Abel is, is very, very, the integrity of the process is huge. Anybody who's in, interested in getting involved with all that spare time that we all have, it would be really great if you contact Abel. Is it up there? No? His um, email address, but we, we have it. So thanks very much, okay. Abel. Thank you. Um, so that almost concludes our morning session. We're letting you out ahead of time for lunch, so there's no excuse not to be back here at a quarter to two for a bit of a treat, the video montage from Jason. Just before you leave, can I emphasize there are some posters. We just invited posters for what and some very, very interesting topics out to the right, down, um, sorry, out over to the left, straight across from here in the bar. Um, lunch is when you go out the door, just to the left there, and uh, down past the fountain. So we'll see you back here at a quarter to two. Thanks very much. <laughs>